All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening, good evening. I almost don't want to start the shir. It's so nice to hear all of the friendships and all of the socializing. It's so beautiful. It's wonderful, Baruch Hashem, to be back giving the shir. I want to apologize because I know that last year there was a lot of cancellations, rescheduling. So hopefully, again, this is the season for tshuva. So I'm going to try to be better in Yerat Hashem going forward. But it is an incredible schos, Baruch Hashem, to be able to usher in this period of Yamim Noraim with a beautiful gathering like this tonight, all of us here for one purpose, which is to try to figure out how to best maximize the days and the weeks ahead. I want to begin by thanking all of those who sponsors tonight's cheer, to thank our sheer sponsors, Rina Dubin, with gratitude for the warmth and inspiration from the women that attend the women's Shabbos Perke Abbas Chabura, and with gratitude to Devorah Stern for your initiative and encouragement. A thank you to Debbie Sugar for dedicating the shir tonight in the Schusser Rafush Limer for Chaya Rivka Bas Nechama, and to Ellie and Devorah Kohn wishing the entire Kehila Iksiva Vachasima Tova. I also want to take the opportunity to thank our Tamut Torah sponsors, those families and individuals who sponsor all of the Shurim and Drushos over the course of a month, to thank Jerry and Sarah Walaski for dedicating all of the Shurim and Drushos this month in the Schus of Rafu Shlema for Zachariah Dov Ben Peral Shira, to thank the Tilson and Wall families of Eretz Yisrael for dedicating all of the Shurim and Drushos this month in the Schus of wishing everyone a Shana Tova Umesuka, and to thank Shandy and Avram Kelman, formerly of Baltimore, now of Eretz Yisrael, for dedicating all the Shurim and Drushos this month in memory of their beloved parents and in the schus of all of those who need a refua shalema, and to thank Mrs. Selma Wolf for dedicating all of the shiurim and drashos this month with immense gratitude to Hashem and with tfilos for health for all in the new year. We thank all of our sponsors for their incredible generosity. And with that, let us begin. So when we scheduled this year, you know, a, a few weeks back, so I also want to take the opportunity to thank our executive director, Shani Topper, who works just so hard. in coordinating everything that we do in the shul. So Shani's very good, very conscientious, asked me for a title. So to think of a title for a shear, you know, a few weeks in advance, a little bit difficult. So much of what I decide to, to present oh, is so much about what I'm, what I'm dealing with. I don't mean like dealing with, but I, you know, what, what I'm thinking about going into the Amim Noraim. But the truth is my, my original intention is as the title said over here, a journey through the machzer. You know, there is so much that we do, so much that we daven over the course of Rosh Hashanah, over the course of Yom Kippur. And so often we're just focused on like keeping up, on keeping pace. And most of us lead a hectic and manic pace of life in general. So it's not like there's that much free time before Yom Noah to sit down, leaf through the machzer, see what it is that I'm going to daven. So I thought it would be an incredible opportunity to really go through the machzer. So as I sat down and began to prepare this year, I realized, okay, so to go through the machzer, that's a five, six part series. That, that's, not, that's not a one night shear. So what I wanted to try to do tonight is maybe focus on an overarching theme that runs through the majority of tefillos over Rosh Hashanah and to try to use that to develop a theme, a theme that I think we could very much hold on to, and a thing that we could focus on going on to these days. So let's begin with number one. So the tour writes as follows. So Amr of Hai. So the tour quotes Rav Hai Gon. And Rav Hai Gon says as follows. He says, Minog lomar tachnunim bahanach asara yomim lochut. There is a minog to go ahead and recite additional prayers during these 10 days. Now it's interesting. Rav Hai Gon is of course referring for, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. But it's here where we are first introduced to the concept, source number one, where we are for, first introduced to the concept that during these 10 days, there is a concept of increasing tefillah. Now you have to understand the enormity of that, of that statement. As Jews, we already daven a lot. There's a lot of davening, right? On any given day, we have three tefillos. And those tefillos, again, there's a lot, Aviva, thank you. There, 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 there's a lot to them. There, the Rebetzin should also get a round of applause. I think if the executive director does, good, okay. Good. I'll pay for that later, but that's fine, okay. <laughs> so we dive in a lot as it is. So the fact that Rav Haigon comes along and says that during these 10 days, we dive in even more. 
We dive it even more. Now, if you notice, he doesn't say it's a halacha. He doesn't say you have to increase the number of tefillos or the amount that we pray, but it's the minog. And he says, levakish rachamim The more you daven during these days, the more you pray, zechus hulo. It is a benefit. It's beneficial. It's a zechus. It's a, it's a benefit to the individual. Now, so here's what's interesting. So this is how the tour introduces us to Yamim Noraim. If you want to know what is Yamim Noraim about, what is it all about? Prayer. It's fascinating. What doesn't the tour say? Right? If, you were, if you were writing the sign of the tour and you wanted to give an introduction to Yamim Noraim, what is Yamim Noraim all about? What would you say? Shuva. Right? Again, that, that's what, it's Shuva. It's all about Shuva, but interestingly enough, Shuva is, plays a role, but even if you look at the way, how do we do tshuva, right? How does tshuva find expression in the Yamim Naraim? How does it find this expression? In tefillah, right? So it's interesting. Although there is a, there is a framework of tshuva, right? And remember, again, there's a whole process of tshuva that I'm outlined in the Lachos Tshuva, but tshuva itself finds its expression in davening. We're going to start slichos in Mirz Hashem. While the Sfarim already started Rosh Chodesh Elo, we Ashkenazim, we will start it in Mirz Hashem this coming Matzi Shabbos. What is slichos? What is slichos? Slichos, the truth is, is a lot of it is confession. A lot of it is tshuva. So even though tshuva is important during these days, but tshuva takes place in the context of tefillah. The entirety of Yamim Noraim is prayer. And the more you pray, the more you pray, the more beneficial it is. In fact, if you take a look at number two, in the Sefer Sif Seichin, he quotes from the Hasidic master, Rav Uri, Rav Uri of Strelisk. And Rav Uri of Strelisk says as follows. He says, She'ef shaliros es golda mala satzila. The Rebbe says, you could see how powerful and important prayer is. Why? Mizesh she'berash ha'shan yom kippurim lo tiknu lano kadmonenu lilmod kamadapim gimara Oh Rambam, oh Bishar Svarim, yes, Hashanah. This is such an amazing observation, right? Rosh Hashanah is a day of judgment. Now, the truth is, we're not really going to touch on that as much tonight because that's even like a separate concept. But one would have thought that Rosh Hashanah would have more behavioral mitzvos associated with it, right? What's the only behavioral mitzvah, mechanistic behavior that's associated with Rosh Hashanah? Shofar. And by the way, What's incredible about that? Take a year like this one. There's no shofar this year. I mean, there is shofar, it's on day two. It's on day two, but there's no day one shofar, which is such an incredible idea. So Rosh Hashanah has one mechanistic mitzvah, and yet some years, it just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. So the Rebbe says, it's interesting. One would have thought that on Rosh Hashanah, there'd be a mandate to learn more. I don't know, learn more Torah. You should learn more Torah on Rosh Hashanah. Or you should do more chesed on Rosh Hashanah. Now again, is it good to learn more Torah on Rosh Hashanah? Of course. Good to do more chesed on Rosh Hashanah? Of course. Is that part of the fabric of the Yantiv? And the answer is no. What is part of the fabric of the Yantiv? Rak tiknu lanu lehispalel yoser. We have one job. The one, the one obligation, the one mandate over Yamim Noraim is to daven more. More prayer. More prayer. So such a fascinating idea. Prayer, which plays a central role in our daily Judaic lives. And by the way, this is true. This is true however one davens, right? There are people who daven from a siddur. And there are people who just talk to the Ribbon Shaimar, my grandmother Zichron of the Bracha. I never in my life saw her davin from a Siddur. But I have never seen someone who davened like my grandmother Zichron of the Bracha. There are different ways to davin. We all daven in different ways. All daven in different I think women could certainly relate to this concept much more than men can. The ability to pray almost in a spontaneous fashion in just a direct dialogical connection with that Kaddish Baruch Hu. So prayer is, is part of the lifeblood of our people. But apparently that which we do the whole year is not enough. Comes Rosh Hashanah, you have to do even more. You have to do even more. And that becomes the major avoda of the day. 
Now, this is important. Why? Because this helps to explain something fascinating. If you look at number three, so once again, on the Sefer Sif Seichen, he writes, he says, so this is fascinating. So how did, so now that we see that the major, so let's follow what we have. Rav Haigon introducing us to the concept that on Rosh Hashanah he says, you have to dive in even more. Rav Uri of Strelisk on Yomim No Ra'im, you don't have to learn, there's no obligation to learn more Torah, there's no obligation to give more tzedakah, to do more chesed, there is just an obligation to daven more. Rosh Hashanah is all about tefillah. Because of that, the rabbis did something very interesting, which is they varied the text of prayer. If you think about it, why is it so often, so think about this, just take a step back. Having kavana during davening, Right, having proper, however you define kavana, concentration, intent, meditation, why is it often difficult to have kavana when we daven? Because any time you do something repeatedly, it becomes by rote. Right? So in other words, many of us could daven an entire davening without even giving it a second thought. Right? The words, I know the words, I know the davening, I can go through it, I can start, I can begin it. So what did the rabbis do by Rosh Hashanah? It's, it's not just Rosh Hashanah, it's Yamim Noraim, is they changed the text of prayer. They change the text of prayer. Now what happens when you change the text of prayer? What does that do? What does that do? It forces people to pay attention, right? I'm not going to take a show of hands, but how many of us end up repeating Shemona Esrei multiple times over the course of Aser Yisimei Tshuva because we forgot to put in HaMelech HaKadosh and instead we said HaKel HaKadosh. Because again, 355 days of the year, I'm saying it one way. So this is incredible. So why, why is it that the tefillos of Yamim Noraim are so different? That is by design to get us to concentrate, to get us to focus. Because prayer is the ikr, it is the primary part of Aser Yisimei Tshuva, Chazal wanted us to be especially attentive. How do you get people to be especially attentive? Change the verbiage. By the way, it just happens to be an incredible idea in general, in general also about relationships. How in relationships, sometimes it's important to not always express the same things in the same way. Sometimes the way you show love and the way you show that you're attentive to something is different word selections different word choices. It could be the difference between telling someone, I love you, right? And I love you very much. Or I love you because. You're expressing the same sentiment, but by going ahead and changing the words, by changing the verbiage, one is, getting, one is being more attentive to that which it is that they're trying to express. So therefore, again, in number three, the Sisechein writes, Chazal changed the framework specifically of Shemona Esrei, to get us to be even more attentive to prayer. Now, what are the major changes? What are the major changes? So interestingly enough, and th this, if you look, we're gonna, we're gonna look through it in just a moment. The one major change that goes through almost the entirety of davening from Mayriv on the first night of Rosh Hashanah through what we'll call Mincha on the last day of Rosh Hashanah, is a hyper focus on Malchus, on the kingship of God, the monarchical identity of the Ribbono Shal Olam. What is this based on? If you take a look at number four, so the Gemara Masechas Rosh Hashanah writes as follows. The Gemara says, Va'amru lefanai Rosh Hashanah, Malchios, Zichronos, Bishofros. So remember again, we are familiar with these three concepts, Malchios, Zichronos, and Shofros. Remember, where do they appear? Where do they appear? Musaf. So, right, th this is Malchios, Zichronos, and Shofros are the three major sections within Musaf, Shmona, Esrei on both days. On the first day of Rosh Hashanah, second day of Rosh Hashanah, right? That's, remember again, we blow Shofar, we blow Shofar at four different stages. We have blow Shofar before we start Musaf, and then again, different in Hagim, but everyone's blowing during Malchios, Zichronos, and Shofros, and then the last set of blasts in the final Kaddish. So Machios, Zichronos, and Shofros, Machios, speaks about, again, God as a king. Remember, there are many different ways in which we relate to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We'll come back to that in just a moment. On Rosh Hashanah, 
the emphasis is on God as a king. That's Marios, Zichronos, the concept that Hashem remembers everything, and Shofros, which is a focus on the Shofar, but most specifically a focus on messianic redemption, which is going to be heralded in by the blasting, by the blast of the Shofar. So what's interesting about this is as follows. We often think about Machios, like I said before, as a section in Musaf. But the truth is, I, I attached on the sheet over here a couple of sections from, from the Machser. So take a look, skip a little bit now, to page three in your packet. Page three in your packet. So right now we're gonna, we're gonna go, I have to stay true to the title, we're going to go on a journey through the Machser. Right? So just a couple of pieces, but just to highlight one central idea. If you look on page number three, so just to show you what we're looking at over here, we're looking at Mayriv Shmona Esrei. So first night of Rosh Hashanah, this is the first Rosh Hashanah tefillah. The first dramatic change we have, actually the truth is I forgot the first. The first one really is Zachreinu Lechaim Melech Chafetz Bachaim. Remember us for life, the king who desires life. That is the first time in the Rosh Hashanah liturgy that we find God referred to as king. Melech. Next, next time again now is page three. This is the brach of Atta Kadosh. So if you remember again, in Yom Tov Davin on Rosh Hashanah, the brach of Atta Kadosh is elongated, right? So it begins again, Atta Kadosh, and then you can see on page three, Uvechein, Sein Pachtuch Hashem Aleinu. This is going to be another theme that is linked with monarchy. We ask God to put his fear upon all of his creations. Such an interesting thing to ask, right? Most of us don't want fear, right? Fear is generally something we try to overcome, right? If I'm afraid of something, right, my goal is I try to overcome that fear. Here we're asking God to place his fear upon all of creation. Hold on to that. But go to page four. Go to page four. How does the bracha of Atta Kadosh end? The last line on page four. Baruch Atta Hashem HaMelech HaKadosh. So we have Melech Chafetz Bachayim, HaMelech HaKadosh. Go to page five. Shachris, Shachris on Rosh Hashanah begins in a fascinating way, right? Normally, again, on a regular Shabbos, a regular Yom Tiv, Shachris begins with Shochen Ad. Shochen Ad. On Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur, we do something very interesting. Where does Shachris begin? HaMelech. HaMelech. And in fact, there is, an, I think, for me, it's one of the most... Um, one of the most overwhelming moments of Yamim Noraim, because the minag is that the chazan says Hamelech sitting at his seat. Right? He doesn't go up to the Ahmed. He says Hamelech sitting on his seat. And again, it's one of those, it's like unexpected. It's un, even though it's expected, it's unexpected. The identity of God as king is so overwhelming that the chazan himself is even reticent to approach the Ahmed. So he says Hamelech kind of, you know, humbled in his own seat. So here we have it. Once again, Hamelech, the king. Page six. Page six. Page six is actually a copy over here from Musaf Shmona Esrei. And this is the topic of Malchius. So this is the actual section of Malchius itself. Page seven. Page seven. Again, if you look at this, this is the concluding bracha of Malchius. And what do we say? Elokeinu velokeinu velokeinu. Meloch al olam kula bechvodecha. Meloch al olam. Rule, right? Anoint yourself as the monarch over the entire world. And again, if you skip now to page 8, sorry, we're just moving along a little bit. Baruch atah Hashem, melech al kol haaretz. Hashem, you are the king. One more example of this, actually just two more examples of this. If you take a look on page 9, perhaps one of the most stirring tefillos of the entire Rosh Hashanah davening, the tefillah of Unisana Tokev. The truth is, we could have a shir. I think in past years we did a shir on Unisana Tokev. Maybe it uh, requires another shir. So Unisana Tokev, again, one of the most moving and dramatic prayers. So what do we say? Unisana Tokev, Kidusha Sayom, Kihu Ayom Venara Ubo Tinase Malchusecha. What happens? What happens on this day? On it, your kingship will be exalted. Again, one more example of this. One more example of this. If you turn to page, turn to page, actually two more examples, sorry, still. Page 44, how does Unisana Tokif end? Sorry, I mean page page 11, I'm sorry. Page 11, how does Unisana Tokif end? Vi'ato hu melech 
Kel Chai the Kayom. But you are the king. You are the king. And again, last example of this, page 12 in Avinu Malkeinu. What do we say? Avinu Malkeinu, the second line, the asterisk line, Ein Lanu Melech Ela Ata. We have no king but you. We have no king but you. Even the formulation itself of Avinu Malkeinu. So what you begin to see is something incredibly amazing, which is the concept of Malchus, of anointing God or accepting HaKadosh Baruch Hu as our monarch, is not simply something that is limited to the section in Musaf Shmona Esrei called Malchus, but focusing on God as king is the dominant theme throughout the entire davening of Rosh Hashanah. This concept of being Mamlech Hashem, coronating God, accepting God as king is the dominant theme. So the question is, what does it mean? What, what, what does it mean to acknowledge God as king? And, and I want to point something out, which is we relate to our Kaddish Baruch Hu in many different ways, right? What are the, some of the ways in which we, we, know, we refer to God in different ways? We have different relationships with God. What are some examples we have with our Kaddish Baruch Hu? Avinu, Father. What else? I'm sorry? Right? Shepherd, excellent. And the truth is, remember, we have, we have a Kaddish Baruch Hu as a shepherd. We have a Kaddish Baruch Hu as a father. We have a Kaddish Baruch Hu as a mother. Shira Shirim is the Ribono Shel Olam as a spouse. We have all of these different portals of connection with our Kaddish Baruch Hu. All of these different portals of connection. But yet, Rosh Hashanah, we seem to place all of those on the side. And prayer is preoccupied with God as king. And somehow, it's my job, right? We go into Rosh Hashanah thinking, what's, what's the avod of Rosh Hashanah? To be mamlech Hashem, to coronate God. What, what, what does that mean, to coronate God? What does that mean to declare God as my king? And how is declaring God as my king different than declaring God as my father, as my mother, as my spouse, as my shepherd? What, what does it mean to be Mam Hashem. So now, again, just to kind of bring everything that we've done up until now, we now see that the essence of Rosh Hashanah, really, Asar Simit is prayer. It's all about tefillah. All about tefillah. Specifically, what type of tefillah? Tefillah which focuses on HaKadosh Baruch Hu as our king. But what does that mean? And what exactly am I supposed to do with this monarchical relationship? So I want to share with you something incredibly amazing. And I want to just tell you, like, this is actually something that's, but it's funny. I, I find Rosh Hashanah to be almost one of the, one of the most enigmatic Yamim Tovim. And it isn't, it's a totally enigmatic Yom Tov. It's enigmatic Yom Tov because remember, what does the Torah tell us about Rosh Hashanah? What does the Torah tell us? Yom Trua. That's it. That's it. Yom Trua. Nothing about judgment. Not, not, nothing. Anything we know about Rosh Hashanah being a Yom Adin, a day of judgment, is from the Gemara. It's from Chazal, right? They learn it out from different... But again, the Torah itself makes no reference to Rosh Hashanah as a day of judgment. So I have Rosh Hashanah as a day of judgment, but now what I also see is I have Rosh Hashanah as a day of Malchus, of Malchus. So what exactly is it that I'm supposed to... Like, we go into this day. If somebody were to ask you, what is your goal on Rosh Hashanah? What would you answer? What's your goal on Rosh Hashanah? Quick, quick, tshuva, tshuva. Is that it? Now, by the way, of course, that's always right. Except it's not right, right? Is Rosh Hashanah a day of tshuva? No. What's the proof that Rosh Hashanah is not tshuva? What's the proof? There's no vitoy. There's no slichos, right? There's no achet. Remember again, if, even think about this year, there's not even Avinu Malkinu because it's Shabbos on the first day. Right? Rosh Hashanah, I just want to point out, Rosh Hashanah makes almost no reference to sin. It makes almost no reference to tshuva. So isn't it fascinating, right? For all of us, our effective reaction is, Rosh Hashanah, I'm going to do tshuva. Only one problem. If you open up the machzer and you're looking for somewhere in davening to do tshuva, you're not going to find it. What you will find is Malchus, 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 Malchus. God is king, God is the Melech. That theme you will find over and over and over, which leads us to one conclusion which we still don't understand, which is the essence of Rosh Hashanah 
is anointing the Ribbono Shal Olam as king. I know that's what I have to do. I just have absolutely no idea what that means. So take a look at number five. This is from an incredible sefer called Yimei Zikaron. Yimei Zikaron is a compilation of Tshuva Drushas given by Rabbi Soloveitchik, Zeich Sadik Levracha. So, you know, the, the Rav used to give, the Rav used to give, when you give a, a Tshuva Drusha, the Tshuva Drushas could go on for four to five hours. Four to five hours. So that a rabbi could speak for four to five hours, that, that's not a Chiddush, right? What the Chiddush was is that people listened for four to five hours. The, the Rav was, a, the Rav was a, a master orator and was able to keep an audience spellbound for multiple hours. So these drushas, some of them, they're recorded in different places, different snippets of it. And here Rabbi Soloveitchik speaks at the Kansta Malchus. Look what he writes. First line in number five. He says, <laughs> He says as follows. <laughs> So what's interesting is as follows. Rabbi Soloveitchik points out, it's not just that we anoint God, right, in Rosh Hashanah, whatever that means, but we actually ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu to foist his monarchical identity upon mankind. Force it on us. Force it on us. Put it on us. Right? Flex your monarchical muscles and you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, foist that identity upon all of mankind. He says, what, what does that mean? Shaharei, miritsono hatov adayin ein ha'adam muchan lekabel al atzmo ol machushemai. Rabbi Salvechik says something amazing. He says, you want to hear overwhelmingly incredible? Most of us are simply not ready to accept God as our king. I am not ready to accept the yoke of heaven. <laughs> what does that mean? He's incredible. He says, Man is very often unripe. Right? Man is not fully developed. Man is often arrogant. Right? With an inflated sense of self. And because of that, he's simply unwilling to recognize the greatness of the monarchy of God. So he doesn't see the greatness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You know, in life, Rabbi Soloveitchik writes, sometimes it's not just that we don't see the truth, it's that we don't want to see the truth. We don't want to see the truth. Often in life, I am content and happy living in my alternate reality. Right? I'm, I'm happy to live in a state of cognitive dissonance. I'm happy to live in my world, in my reality that I've created for myself. And I have absolutely no interest in seeing anything else. Sorry. Right? Rabbi Salvechik says, what, what, what do we like to focus on? We like to focus on our accomplishments, right? Here's what I've done. Here's what I've advanced. And this is true, by the way, like this is true on an individual level. So they try on a societal level, right? Man gets very caught up in himself. In himself, here are my advances. Here's what I have done. Here's what I have accomplished. So Rabbi Salvechik over here is describing, and, and again, I want to point out, the Rav here, this is not like a, it's not like a shtach, right? He, it's, it's not that he, it's not a, it's not a musar. Rabbi Salvechik is speaking about the reality of the human condition. And the reality of the human condition is, we just get lost within ourselves. We get lost within ourselves. It's true as a clown, as mankind, it's true as individuals, right? In other words, I focus in life on my stuff, I focus in life on my accomplishments, I focus in life on my needs, and again, I gauge success through whatever metrics I create for myself. Okay? He goes on, he says, Lefichach, mispalalim anu lefnei bari olam. On Rosh Hashanah, we dive into HaKadosh Baruch Hu, sheachriach es ha'adam lahodos be'emes bal karcho. We ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu, make us recognize the truth. 
ובכן סין פח תוכו השם אלוקינו על כל מעשיך. הצל נא פחד ואימה על האדם, שירסה מהגולם, אם אפשר, let me tell you this a little bit outside. Outside, actually, the truth is, you see on the next, uh, turn the page for just a moment, there's one more piece. I'm going to read this piece, then, then we'll bring the Rav together. He says, אין האדם, listen, listen to these words, אין האדם מאמין בבורי עולם, ומסנהג כאילו היה יחידי בעולם. These words, listen, listen, he says, really, man doesn't believe in God. Rather, man operates as if he is the only force in this world. Now, those are very strong words, right? A man doesn't believe in God. I don't think there's one person amongst us here who doesn't believe in it, right? If he didn't believe in God, he'd have better things to do on a, on a Tuesday night. Right? So what does he mean, man doesn't believe in God? And he acts as if he is the only thing in this universe. What Mr. Levitchik is describing is, life often becomes about what I want. What I want. Or what I need. And the essence of life becomes about the satisfaction of the self. What's important in life? What I want. What do I want to accomplish? What I want. What creates the hierarchy of importance? What I want. Everything is about... So when you think as the Rebbe Soloveitchik, essentially a person could op- go through life as if they're the only thing in the universe that matters. But there's something else in this world called the Ratzon Hashem, the will of God. And very often the will of God and the will of man are not the same Thing. You know, the Ramchal, Ramosh Chaim Litzato, in the introduction to Mesil Asisharim, I've quoted this many times over the years, the Ramchal says that a person has to ask themselves a very fundamental question. What's the fundamental question? Ma chovaso ba'olamo. What is my obligation in this world? Now it's interesting because when we're young, right, but we're not so young, right? What's the question we ask ourselves? What's the question we ask ourselves? What do I want to do when I grow up? Right? What are, some of us are still growing up, right? What, what, what do I want to do? And Michal says, that's actually not the question. The question is, what does God need me to do in this world? And the reality of life is that very often what I want to do and what God wants me to do are not the same things. There, sometimes, sometimes it aligns. Sometimes it aligns. But very often in life it doesn't align. So what do you do in those moments when there's a conflict between what we call the Ratzon Atzmi, what I want from life, what I want to do, and the Ratzon Hashem? Who wins when there's a clash? And right, so we know this just from our own day-to-day lives. Every single day I encounter a clash between what I want and what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants. And if I'm honest with myself, more often than not, my needs win out over God's needs. So Rabbi Soloveitchik says, when I live a life like that, that whenever there's a clash, it becomes about my needs, then it's as if I think I'm the only entity living in this world. And suddenly again, it's just about my happiness, my comfort, my appeasement, my needs says Rabbi Soloveitchik something absolutely amazing. What does it mean that we anoint HaKadosh Baruch Hu? What does it mean to be mamlech? You know, when you have a king, when you have a king, what is the most important thing in the kingdom? The most important thing in the kingdom is what the king wants. What the king wants becomes the directive for how the constituency lives. The king's vision for the kingdom is executed ultimately again by the constituency of the monarchy. Says Rabbi Soloveitchik something absolutely amazing. What does it mean to coronate HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Coronating God being Mamlech Hashem means I make the conscious decision to align my will with His. I say, Ribono Shalom. I'm tired of living in conflict with you. So think about this in just a moment. How many of us are living in daily conflict with God? 
Now, the truth is, the great part about the human mind is, no, I'm not, I'm not in conflict. We just have different interpretations, right? I have a different ashkaf, I have a different this. Have, right? We come up with all kinds of things to justify, you know, the collision course of our will and God's will. But the truth is, it's so much better just to be honest with oneself and recognize, yeah, often I am living butting heads with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. There's what I want and there's what He wants. And I don't want the same things that He wants of me. And He wants different things of me than I want of me. So the entire essence of Rosh Hashanah is where I say, I'm tired of the conflict. I want to identify the areas of my life that are in conflict with the will of Hashem. And I want to bring them under His umbrella. I want to alleviate the relationship friction. I want to alleviate the areas of conflict. And I want my will to become HaKadosh Baruch Hu's will. Right? This is a Mishnah in Perkei Avos. Asei Ritzoncha Ritzono. Make your will His will. The entire essence of our relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You know, it's, it's interesting. I've come to find that one, one of the most, one of the most flawed concepts in modern day marriage, I don't know if that was good English, one of the most flawed concepts in the way that people contemporarily look at relationships is that like, you know, two people are married, but we're still two totally separate independent people. Two totally separate independent people. No, that, that's, actually, that's actually not marriage. That could be a friendship. That could be a friendship, or that could be a bad marriage, right? But, but th that's, that's not... The, the beauty of marriage, the beauty of marriage, is as the Torah says, Al ken yazov ish es aveves imo, v'davak b'ishto, v'hayu l'basar echad. The whole concept of marriage is aligning the rutzon of a husband with the rutzon of a wife. Doesn't mean that, they're, that they lose total personalistic independence? Of course not. Of course not. There's still, there's still a part of me that's also an individual. But in terms of the goal of marriage is the merging, the merging of the rutzon of two people into one unified, harmonious rutzon. That's the goal. And if you can't do that, that's where a whole host of Shalom Bayez problems come from. What's true in marriage is equally as true in our relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We go through life, we go through life, and it's interesting, you know, all of, everyone has relationships where they accept some level of dysfunction, right? Do you remember like when you're young and you have a problematic relationship and so you assume, okay, I'm gonna fix this, I'm gonna fix this. And then you get older and you recognize that there are just certain relationships that are broken. They're broken, I'm gonna do my best to deal with them as they are, but I cannot make this into the ideal relationship. It just, there's a piece of it that's always gonna be broken. A lot of times we live that way with the Kaddish Baruch Hu also. There are things that God, God and I see eye to eye on, things in which we get along, and areas in life in which we are going to agree to disagree. He wants this, I want something totally different. And somehow, that level of relationship dysfunction becomes acceptable to us. But the problem is, if I live with that level of relationship dysfunction, that means the spiritual intimacy is not there. The spiritual closeness is not there because although we're in a relationship, it's not as loving and as close as it could be. The entire avod of Rosh Hashanah, explains Rabbi Soloveitchik, is to make Hashem my king. By making Hashem my king requires an incredible degree of personalistic honesty. To say, Ribono shal olam. I want to acknowledge that the following areas of my life are not in sync with what you want of me. I want to acknowledge that that is the reality of my existence. And I want to acknowledge the areas. And by the way, here's the incredible part. Do you have to fix them? Do you have to fix them? No. You know what you have to do? You have to acknowledge that they exist and you have to express a desire to bring them into alignment. That is the entire avoda of Rosh Hashanah. To identify the areas in which there is relationship discord because my ratzon is not Hashem's ratzon. To say, Ribono shal olam, 
I'm identifying them, I'm owning them, I'm acknowledging them. Maybe I can fix them now, maybe I can't fix them now. But here's what I want to tell you. I want to fix them. At some point, in some way, I want to merge my ratzon, my will, into your will. I want this to become a totally harmonious and loving relationship. That, says Rabbi Soloveitchik, is the entire essence of being mam lechashem, of making HaKadosh Baruch Hu your king. Now, what happens? What happens? So first of all, suddenly again, a new dimension of Rosh Hashanah. A new dimension of Rosh Hashanah. Suddenly, it's all about actually just looking at my life. You see, it's interesting. People often think that what kavana means, what kavana means, right? What's the definition of kavana and davening? What's the definition of kavana and davening? Concentration, perish. I'm really such words. I want to tell you something. You know how you know that you're at a good davening? If your mind wanders. Now, don't leave yet. Let me explain that. In other words, if, your, if tefillah creates for you the space to think about your life, even if you don't know the meaning of one word that you're davening, that is a successful prayer. Rav Shem Shnufal Hirsch brings down the Hebrew word to daven is lehit palel. Lehit palel. So remember again, the shorish of lehit palel is pe lamid lamid, palal, which means, which means to, in, to judge. Lehit palel is the reflexive form of that word, which means the process of engaging in personalistic judgment. The entire essence of tefillah is to serve as a platform to think about my life. The entire avodah of Rosh Hashanah. I keep on referring to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you're my melech, you're my melech, you're my melech. Well, if you are my melech, if you really are my melech, that means that your ratzon as king, what you want, God, is more important than what I want. Okay, so let me identify the areas of life where I have put my wants and needs before your wants and needs. Let me identify them. And let me at least try, let me make a promise to myself today that my goal over the coming year is going to bring those areas in which there's currently ratzon discord and bring them into beautiful, harmonious consonants with the ratzon Hashem. That's what it means to be Mam Hashem. That's a Rosh Hashanah. So if over the course of two days, you go ahead and you figure out those areas of your life where you are not living in accordance with the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but it may be your own will. First of all, don't beat yourself up over it because we all have areas like that. But being brave enough to identify, you know, we spend so much energy justifying things that we know are incorrect. When there's such an easier way to do it, which is, which is, own it. Here's the great part. You know in Yiddishkeit there's a concept that you could own a mistake and not be ready to fix it? it sounds a little bit crazy, right? Because if I really know it's a mistake. Sometimes in life, I know that there are things that are broken. I'm not ready to fix it yet. For whatever the reason. Maybe there are familial issues. Maybe there are social issues. Maybe there are relationship issues. Maybe there are personal I know, I know something's broken. I'm not ready to fix it. So we think if we're not ready to fix it, we have to instead make excuses as to why it's really not broken. And all that is, is it's just gauging in self-delusion and just a total waste of time and mental energy instead. So should sure it to say, it's broken. This is broken, this is broken, this is broken. Here, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I'm not following your will, I'm not following, I'm not following your will, okay? I've acknowledged it. Am I fixing it now? No. No, no. But at least now that I've acknowledged and owned it, I know the work I have to do going forward. I might not be ready to make the heavy lift yet, but I know what I have to do. And that's Rosh Hashanah. But then something amazing happens. The moment, the moment, a person expresses just the willingness to ultimately align my will with the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, something dramatically happens, something dramatic happens, which is what is endowed with life clarity. The greatest challenge we face as people is not sin. We all sin, right? We all sin. Everyone sins. Everyone sins. I know people think, I know exactly who the Rabbi Silver is talking about right now. Right? No, we, right, we, we all sin. We all sin, right? The only variable is 
what is your sin of choice, right? And how good you are at it, right? But all of us, all of us commit Averos day in and day out. The greatest challenge of man is not sin. The greatest challenge of man, take a look at number six. The greatest challenge of man is ambiguity. Is ambiguity. Is that so often we go through life and I don't know like what's right and what's wrong, right? We like to say that in life there's a lot of gray. The truth is there's a lot less gray than we actually think there is. We just think that there's a lot of gray because often we ourselves are just shrouded in the ambiguity of life. What's right, what's wrong, where does that ambiguity come from? That ambiguity comes from a lack of alignment between what I want out of life and what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants for me out of life. When there is disconnect between my Ratzon and the Ratzon Hashem, I can't see the world for what it is. I can't see life for what it is. And I can't see myself for what it is. I'll give you the perfect proof to this. Think about, think about the most incredible spiritual moment you've had in your life. Or in your life, in the last couple of years, right? A, a moment of just incredible connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. How did you feel in that moment? How did you feel? How did you feel? I'll tell you if you're happy, right? I'll tell you if you feel. The world makes sense, right? I'll tell you when often we feel this. You know that feeling by Ni'ilah, right? When Ni'ilah is over, right? Hashem Elohim, it's over, it's over, and Yom Kippur is over. Okay, so you're a little hungry, a little tired, uh, fine. But there is such a feeling of contentment and such a feeling of clarity and such a feeling of the world is exactly as it should be. Do you know why that is? Because in Ni'ila, right, in Ni'ila represents that one time of year where there is perfect harmony between my will and HaKadosh Baruch Hu's will. When those two Ritzonos line up, I have clarity in the world. I know what I need to do, I know how I have to do it, and I know what has to get done. I have clarity. When there's a disconnect between my will and the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that's when there's often so much life ambiguity. The greatest challenge we face is not sin. The greatest challenge we face ultimately is having a lack of clarity in life. So if we bring this all together, here's what we have, right? We have, let's bring this all together, then we'll just end off with one last point. So we have Rav Haigon telling us that the entire essence of Yamim Noraim is tefillah. It's all about prayer. And although it's not just any prayer, it's prayer with an incredible emphasis on being mamlich, on anointing or coronating HaKadosh Baruch Hu as king. Constant reference to God as a melech. Not any relationship, melech, melech, melech. What does it mean to be mamlich HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Strabe Soloveitchik explained again in number five, ultimately alignment of my ratzon with his ratzon. What Rosh Hashanah is, is an acknowledgement, a moment of brutal personalistic honesty. And that's why, by the way, don't share this with anyone else, right? It's no one else's business, right? This is between you and God. This is a conversation between me and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. God, I just want to, be, I want, I want to have just an open and honest conversation. And I want to talk about the areas of our relationship where we are not connecting. And I know why we're not connecting. Because you want one thing and I want something different. And I'm going to stop explaining it away. I'm going to stop making excuses or inventing different theologies or ideologies. I'm just going to own it. I'm just going to own it. And I want you to know, my God, that my ultimate goal is to align my will with your will. It might take me a little bit of time, but, and by a little bit, I mean like the rest of my life. But, but I want you to know that I'm committed to this process. The moment you make that commitment, suddenly your whole worldview changes. There's a clarity that's there. There's the ability to see the world, and now, Rosh Hashanah makes so much sense. There's no tshuva on Rosh Hashanah, right? There's no confession on Rosh Hashanah. And the truth is, there's nothing else. Isn't it interesting, by the way? When you go home from Shul on Rosh Hashanah, you ever find yourself wondering, like, what am I supposed to do now, right? Okay, you eat lunch, right? And of course, again, you struggle to stay awake for the afternoon, right? Because, I mean, not to nap, not to sleep on Rosh Hashanah. You ever wonder to yourself, like, we just had, like, this davening, now, now what? Now what, right? Like there's nothing, it's interesting, right? Like there's nothing to plug into because 
the entire essence of Rosh Hashanah is cognitive, emotional, not behavioral or mechanistic. The entire avoda of Rosh Hashanah is a conversation with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, again, acknowledging Him as King, acknowledging the areas where my will doesn't align with His, owning those areas, owning that disconnect, pledging to do better, pledging to align them. That's Rosh Hashanah. There's no other additional mitzvah. There's nothing else to do but engage in that level of emotional connection, of relationship connection. And that's why, again, there's no tshuva in Rosh Hashanah. There's no vidui, there's no confession. Do you know why? Because before you could get to any of that stuff, before you get to any of that stuff, right? If you want to do real tshuva, what do you need in order to do tshuva? What do you need? What do you need? Clarity. If you don't have clarity in life, then how do you know what's right and what's wrong? If I don't have clarity in life, how do I know what I have to fix now, what I have to start doing, what I have to stop? How, how, do, you, how, do, you know how, to, how do you know how to do tshuva? I, I just want to point out, do you ever wonder, ever wonder, maybe you know someone like this? It's Elul, right? Maybe you know someone who is in the same exact spot this Elul as they were last Elul. Maybe you know someone like that, right? And, and if you talk to that person, that person will tell you, it's the most frustrating thing in the world. That's why so many of us dislike Elul so much. Because when I look at my life, I feel like I didn't move the needle. And then I always say, well, why, why didn't I move the needle? It's not, I'm not lazy. I'm not scared to work hard. Do you know what often happens? When you don't have life clarity, you don't know what to do, how to do it, or where to go. The problem is often we run to Yom Kippur and we skip Rosh Hashanah. We forget to do the Avod of Rosh Hashanah. Only once I align my will with HaKadosh Baruch Hu's will does the life clarity kick in. Only once that clarity kicks in does tshuva become possible. And only tshuva which is preceded by clarity has a chance to affect some level of change. For many of us, we've been living a life of Yom Kippur totally bypassing Rosh Hashanah, right? Like we said before, we're at Rosh Hashanah, like we're, we're already doing tshuva already. We're doing tshuva already. Pump the brakes. You can't do tshuva without first anointing a Kaddish Baruch Hu as king. You can't do tshuva without aligning your will with his will. You can't do tshuva with at least at first gaining that clarity that only comes from undergoing a Rosh Hashanah. Once that happens, then tshuva kicks in and then the rest of the Yomim Noraim dynamic could actualize as well. I'll just end off with one last piece. There's a beautiful story. There's a beautiful story that's told by Rav Shlomo Kalbach. And the story is told that uh, Rav Shlomo Kalbach was one time visiting a small Jewish community in Texas. And he was going ahead and on Erev Shabbos, he wanted to use the mikvah in this, in this small town. So he went to the rabbi of the community, asked for the keys to the mikvah. Okay, he's going to the mikvah, Erev Shabbos, fine. As he's walking out of the mikvah, so this big guy, right, cowboy boots, 10-gallon hat, comes walking into the mikvah. Look at the mikvah. All right, it's not a sight you see every day, I guess, even in a small town in Texas. So Shlomo Kavach says to the guy, he says to him in Yiddish, you know, v'smachto, what's out? And the man, the man answered him in flawless Yiddish as well. So Shlomo Kavach says, okay, tell me, what's, what's your story? What's your story? So then I'm going to tell you the truth. I grew up in a Hasidic family of Vizhnitzer Hasidim. And in Vizhnitz, in Vizhnitz, a major part of their, of their theology, so to speak, or their ideology, is serving Hashem B'Simcha. Serving God with incredible joy. And specifically, Shabbos should be done with incredible joy. So this man told Rav Shlomo Karabach, he says, I remember as a boy, I was four years old. My father took me to the, took me to the tish of the vision at Tzareba. And generally, children, children didn't come to the tish. My father really wanted me to come. So I came with a couple of my friends. And he told us to go sit under the Rebbe's table. Just sit under the Rebbe's table and don't make too much noise. So the, so the man says, remember as a kid, the singing was so beautiful. The singing was so incredible. The singing was so incredible. And the Rebbe heard us under the table. 
And every once in a while, he would lift up the tablecloth, peek under, give us a little bit of challah, give us a little bit of kogel, and it was incredible. And the boy says, literally, the singing went on for hours and hours. And then the Rebbe ended the tish, and he said the following. He said, I'm going to quote you, I'm going to read to you from the way from the Rebbe Shalom tells the story. He says like this. He said, Please, the Rebbe said, please listen to me. I want you to remember this until your very last day. There are moments when we feel uplifted, pure, connected, on fire for Yiddishkeit, or yearning for God. We feel we want to do something great, something holy. But when that feeling comes, there's also a voice inside of our head, the Eight Zahara, whispering, come on, I know who you really are and what you did yesterday and what you've got planned for later tonight and what you'd like to do tomorrow. Who do you think you're fooling? Be honest with yourself. You're just having a sudden soul attack and it won't last. The vision of then jumped out of his seat and yelled, Rachmanus, have compassion. Tell the Yitzhahara to leave you alone for just a moment. Tell him to give you five minutes to be close to God. Just five minutes. The Rebbe then sat, reached under the table, and put his hand on my head. This is now this adult man talking. He bent down and said with great sweetness, my precious child, did you hear what I said? I'm begging you. Please don't ever forget it. So the story continues. I'll just quote you the rest. A couple of years later, continued the man. The war broke out. My family fled to America. Suddenly, we didn't have many opportunities for Jewish education, Torah, mitzvos. I don't keep very much anymore. But from time to time, I get the urge to do something holy, to connect, to express my Yiddishkeit. And I remember what the vision of Rebbe said. What's wrong with being holy for a moment? Even if five minutes later, I'll be the lowest. To tell you the truth, this is the man speaking to Shlomo Kalbach. Tell you the truth, I don't even know if I'm going to keep this Shabbos. I don't know if I'm going to be a shul tonight. But just for right now, I felt I wanted to go to the mikvah, to be holy, even just for a couple of minutes. Sometimes when we approach Yamim Noraim, we think that like it's an all or nothing endeavor. Right? Either I'm going to do this perfectly, turn everything around, it's going to be fantastic, become the best version of myself, and anything less than spiritual perfection is worthless. And I just want to end off by saying that is categorically false. A person who over the course of Rosh Hashanah davening has five minutes where they anoint HaKadosh Baruch Hu, even if the rest of Yantiv I'm counting ceiling tiles, right? Even if the rest of Yantiv I'm occupied with whatever, Five minutes where a person is able to say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I just want you to know, although there are so many parts of my life that are, not, that are in a state of disconnect with what you want from me, I want you to know what I want in my heart. And what I want more than anything is for my Ratzon to be aligned with your Ratzon. That's all that I want. I'm not ready to make all the changes now. Maybe I'm not ready to make any of the changes now. But I want you at least to know what I want out of life. In that moment, your mom lech Hashem. In that moment, you have made Hashem your king. In that moment, you have absolute crystal clarity about what you need to do in life, who you need to be in life, what you need to change, and what you need to accomplish. And even if all you have is five minutes of clarity, that is a successful Rosh Hashanah. HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not need us to engage in heroic spiritual activity. HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not need us to turn our lives upside down. HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't even need us right in the moment to make dramatic and overwhelming changes. All He asks of us right now is to make Him our King. All He asks of us on this Yom Tev of Rosh Hashanah is to express a desire to align my will with His will. If I could just get two minutes of that clarity, two minutes of that purity, two minutes of that connection, then I set myself up 
for a beautiful, meaningful, and uplifting Yamim Noraim. Two minutes of coronation of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and Rosh Hashanah could change not just your Yamim Noraim, but could literally change your entire life. We should be Zilcha Mirza Hashem. As we enter into Yamim Noraim, to be able, don't try to have a meaningful davening from beginning to end. I know that sounds like a strange piece of advice. Right? Don't try it. I'll tell you why. I don't think anyone does. I don't think anyone is truly connected from beginning to end. Set for yourself a much more modest goal. I want five minutes of connection. And by the way, maybe it's in shul or maybe it's in your living room. I don't know, you have to decide where it's, where it's, where it's best. I just want to set myself a modest goal of connection, a modest goal of coronation. We should be zolcha miyat Hashem to find a few moments of just pure dialogue with Hashem more than we want to return to Him. You know, do you know, I can only imagine how much HaKadosh Baruch Hu looks forward, looks forward to Yamim Noraim. You know why? Because all the children come home. You know, we just sent a daughter off to seminary, just literally a few days last week. Literally, I'm counting down the days until she comes home. Just counting down the days until she comes home. And that's how I feel about my child. Can you know the excitement that HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Ribbon Shalom is probably pacing back and forth in Shamayim. He can't wait for a week from this Shabbos night. With that Vuhurachum, with that Baruch Hu, when we usher in Yamim Noraim, where he's going to say, thank you. Thank you for coming home. Thank you for coming back. Thank you for wanting to establish and reignite, the, rekindle the relationship. He wants us so badly. And all we have to do is reciprocate that desire for relationship in some small way. Just a few moments of coronation. And if we're able to do that, then that little ember of relationship will literally explode into the most passionate, raging fire of connection with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We should be zochah to be able to feel that even for just a few moments on this Rosh Hashanah. We should be zochah that Amir Hashem that Hashanah should be the portal to a beautiful Yamim Noram. We should be zochah Amir Hashem that HaKadosh Baruch Hu should inscribe all of us together with our families, with our loved ones, with our entire communities, all of Kal Yisrael. For Ksiva Vechasim Tov and Halavai, we should be zochah that the little ember of relationship that we fan into a passionate fire of connection should Amir Hashem become even more luminescent Halal should be zochem yar tashem that in the schus of all of our avodah that this should be the year where Hakadosh Baruch Hu finally brings the geula will be zochem yar tashem to be bekabel penei mishiatikim here be amenu amen.